Okay, so now we're looking at movement in adulthood. So we look at the whole lifespan. Um, and so why do you think we do that? When we think about motor development, we usually think about children, right? That's when we're developing. Um, so to answer this question, we need to go back to the definition of motor development. And remember, we learned the definition in the four steps. So it's changes in motor behavior across the lifespan, right? So that right there, just that second part of the definition across the lifespan tells us that we need to look at motor development from birth across the lifespan to old age, right? So we have to look at the whole thing. And in the first part of the definition, it says that we're looking at changes in motor behavior. Well, changes doesn't have a positive or a negative connotation, right? So changes are not always good. Some changes are bad. So as we age, we have changes in our motor behavior that actually can be um, negative. And so we need to look at both ends of the spectrum to really understand um, motor behavior, motor control, and motor learning. So in older adults, especially with the changes in motor function, changes in sensory function, 30% um, over 65 have fallen at least once, and probably of those, the ones that have fallen at least twice is probably even higher than that because um, it's just kind of a domino effect. Once you've fallen, you've injured yourself, you increase your likelihood of falling again. Um, and so falls are the leading cause of injury in older adults um, and can be related to death. Um, but even below that, hip fracture is a severe injury um, that's common in older adults and it can be debilitating. Okay, which means that they're, if they're not moving, they're not active anymore, that they have muscle weakness and they're increasing their, their chance of injury because they're not moving anymore. So when they do move, they don't have the strength to support themselves. Um, it could also end up um, results in traumatic brain injury. So, and that can cause even more um, motor and functional deficits. So what we want to do with older adults is prevent falls. Um, so the causes of falls can be either predispositional or situational. So predispositional is something about the individual makes them more likely to fall. So if they've already had an injury, they're more likely to fall. Um, if their vision is poor, they're likely to fall. Um, if they have some muscle weakness on one side, they're more likely to fall. So that's something that's native to the individual themselves that puts them at risk of falling. Situational means it's something specific to right now. Okay, so if you walked out in the rain or the snow, then the surface is slippery, which puts you at risk of falling. So that's the difference between those two. And so we have to think about prevention in both of those categories. So um, if, you, if it's the individual and their poor vision, then keeping up with regular exams lets them know if they need corrective glasses or lenses, um, then they can do that, and that helps prevent falls. Um, if they shouldn't be thriving, that's a different whole other story. Um, making sure lighting is good in their home and, and the places that they spend a lot of time. Um, if they are likely to fall, if they're moving slower, or have a harder time raising their feet, then um, they probably want to move. You see a lot of, it's really common with older adults that if they had a, a two-story house, they'll move to a one-story house or they'll move their bedroom downstairs so that they don't really have to get upstairs because um, then that reduces their risk of falls because they're not um, traveling over obstacles. You want to make wider um, space between furniture and the walls so they have plenty of room to maneuver. Um, and then try to get them to exercise as much as possible. Staying active is the, the greatest way to reduce the risk of falls. So there are several different ways you can reduce your risk of falls. You can assess your risk of falls. Um, so one of those is the 30 second chair stand and I'll, I'll make sure you get that video so you can see that and um, that's just an easy way to look at that. Um, you can also just do a survey and this just kind of tells you um, based on things you've noticed about yourself or situations um, and that tells you and your doctor whether you're at risk of falls and whether you should have a conversation about um, prevention safety measures that you can take. 
So in older adulthood, so in where we're losing muscle strength, losing flexibility, um, everything slows down, our vision is poor, balance is poor. And so with that becomes changes in gait, which is really, gait is a fancy word for walking. Mm -hmm. And so it's your, your walking pattern. So older adults are slower, so they, they just take longer to get from A to B. Um, there are smaller step lengths, so that's the distance between one foot and the next. So they're going to have their feet are closer together. And you think um, that sounds like a great, um, great way to, to make sure they don't fall is taking smaller steps. But actually, that small base of support um, means that they're, um, they're more likely to fall just because of the change in gravity, right? You want to have an increased base of support, not too big, that you can't support yourself, but having two small steps um, puts you at risk, increases the, the pull of gravity on you. Uh, low step height, so that's going to put them at risk if they're having to step over an object, so they're not lifting their foot up, um, they're more likely to trip. Increased step width, um, so may not be taking large steps forward, we are like increasing the width of our steps, so we're wide, our steps are wider. Um, and increasing double support time. Double support time means when both feet are on the ground. So when you walk, right, you step and then you pick up a foot and then that next foot goes up. So there's a delay in the, the time for the next foot to go up after one foot gets down. So that's where the slowness happens. And that's, again, to their method of increasing their support system. And... Um, because of changes in motor function, then that limits independence, so they're getting more help, and sometimes their helpers kind of take over and actually get in the way, um, because it just becomes this endless cycle where um, if they are fearful of getting injured, then they do less, people are doing things for them, which means they're moving less, which means they're losing more muscle and more strength and more flexibility, which puts them at greater risk. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off there. Um, with changes in age, so if you zoom into this chart a little bit, you can see for each of these events, they show um, in the Olympic athletes, the pro athletes, um, when they notice a, a start and decline of skill performance at, in the people that are performing that. And so um, and here's the, the mean age here of decline in each of these sports and skills. And so somewhere between 25 and 33, I think you're already starting to see decline in performance. So um, we often think about ourselves getting um, performing worse when we're like over middle age, right? But even in young adults, we see a decline. And so that decline is just the start, right? That's peak performance. So that's when we get to our best performance and then decline goes down from there. It's just necessarily not rapid change where you would notice it from day one to day two. Um, but you will start to see a slow decline um, after young adulthood in skills. So I've said this already, but older adults definitely move slower, right? And some of that is information processing time. Um, so the signals from the brain to the muscles are taking longer and the signals from um, your sensory sensors to the brain are taking longer. So all of that contributes to a slower movement. Um, so that means that they're also going to be delayed in their reaction time. So if I were you know, who playing red light, green light, and said green light, which means that you're supposed to go, they would take longer than someone half their age to just start moving, right? And then the same thing when you said red light, they would take longer to stop um, than someone half their age. Movement time is just how long it takes for them to actually complete the movement. So reaction time is to the stimulus. So I said green light until they actually start moving. So just the initial lifting of the leg and the movement time is how long it takes for them to actually complete the movement. Um, and then there's a speed accuracy trade-off, right? I can't be both fast and accurate at the same time. 
And so the goal of any task decides whether it's slow but very accurate or fast and not so accurate. So um, any like fine motor skills really require a high amount of accuracy. They're going to be much slower in those tasks, whereas um, your gross motor skills, the, they're going to be slower, but it may not be as noticeable because they don't have to slow down so much because gross motor skills are less accurate already. So is it inevitable? Like, can you prevent movement decline? Well, um, all people are going to decline with age, right? That's just the body breaks itself down. Okay, but you can slow down the decline and you can prevent certain types of um, decline. So, so with compensation means that they're, they're using these methods to compensate for their loss of movement. So um, putting forth more effort to compensate for reduced strength and reduce speed, they slow down to make sure that they can be more accurate. Um, they try to anticipate and predict situations. So um, like in the example earlier about red light, green light, right? So they may be able to predict, uh, if you usually take three beats to say red light, then they may be going ahead and slowing down when they think you're about to say red light to, so that they're not having to make a sudden stop. Um, Exercise is highly preventative against decline. It's not going to prevent everything, but um, it's kind of the move it or lose it principle. So if they continue to exercise, continue to be active in the activities that they've been doing since they were young, then they're going to lose less than an adult that was sedentary. So make sure um, when you get old, starting now and then continuing through old age, be um, do regular exercise. And then for those people that are in your life um, and those people that end up training or teaching, make sure they understand the importance of exercise as well. And then so when you're instructing the aging adult, so an older adult, um, whether it's coaching, physical therapy, whatever you end up um, in the field that you end up with, um, you want to think about their sensory and hearing loss, right? So you may need to speak up and speak slowly. Don't run your words all together. Also, on that note, they don't understand the lingo, so make sure you're not using text language. You're using actual clear words that are in the dictionary. Um, you may want to give them some time to instruct them on cues to look for. Um, so tell them, if you're going to tell them, um, <clears throat> if you're going to work on strength training, then um, you want to tell them what the cue means and is before you start doing the exercise as far as technique, right? So if you want them to lock their elbows in while they're doing a biceps curl, then show them what it means to lock their elbows in. Don't expect them to comprehend that in the middle of their exercise. And then try to simplify tasks and um, keep it slow as much as possible. Um, so that it's easier for them to, to perform and reduces their risk of injury. So that's movement in adulthood. And I hope that gives you a good overview of the changes that happen with adulthood and how you can um, make a difference in the lives of older adults um, in improving and maintaining their motor function.